Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy. But we're in this together and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now, many of you who have followed this podcast for a long time and have seen me speak or read other things I've written. Um, and by the way, thank you. We're almost at 2 million downloads now. So thank you for your commitment and listening to the podcast. Well, you know that my husband and I adopted two children uh, 12 and 13 years ago through open adoption with people that we love. When people think of adoption, especially when they don't have firsthand experience with it, they may have some preconceived notions of how people feel and who the people are who are involved with the adoption experience, the birth parents, the children, the adoptive parents, the extended families. Some might believe that birth parents are deviant in some way or callous or uncaring. Uh, the adoptive parents are saviors or do-gooders. The children are simple, uh, uh, great, simply grateful and lucky. But there is a lot to adoption and talking about adoption with kids because the people who are involved are human and multifaceted and they're good and they're faulty they're loving and they're trying to do their best in a situation that has a lot more to it than meets the eye i'm grateful for my children and to their birth parents and i also know that there are a lot more emotions that go with adoption than gratitude this is a tough one for me, everybody. I will admit it first for first first glance, looking at the, the book that we're going to be going through, looking at all of the information we're going to be getting through. It's tough when you have firsthand experience, understanding that this is not all sunshine and happiness every step of the way, even as we are grateful. So how do we talk to kids about adoption and the issues that may be part of their adoption experience or the adoption experience of those we know and love? For that, we talked to Allison davis Maxson. Allison davis Maxson is an expert in the field of child welfare and children's mental health, specializing in attachment, developmental trauma, and permanency and adoption. She is the executive director for the National Center on Adoption and Permanency and was the child welfare consultant on the Paramount Pictures movie, Instant Family. Allison was honored in 2017 with the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, Angels in Adoption Award, and is the co-author of Seven Core Issues in Adoption and Permanency. So welcome Allison to How to Talk to Kids about anything. Hi, Robin. I am thrilled to, to be here and to do a deep dive um, with you. When I found out you're an adoptive mom, honestly, it makes this much more exciting because we can go much deeper into all of the issues. So I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I'm really thrilled you're here too. Uh, as I told you, uh, and I'm very open that this was a tough read for me. Uh, we we do want to simply believe that everything is always perfect and sunshiny and happiness um, from start to finish. Before we go into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't had the opportunity to meet you, to read your book, to read your workbook or work with it, can you tell us what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in talking about, learning about, teaching about, and writing about adoption? Uh, yeah, that it, it's a it's a good question. I love that it kind of takes me back to my first experiences in child welfare in foster care when I was fresh out of graduate school. So this is I was 24 years old. I had to gain my clinical hours to become a licensed therapist. 
And my first job was at a residential treatment facility for children of high trauma that were neglected and abused. And this was back in the day, and it's 30 years ago now, where we had a lot of large residential facilities. All of these children were dependents in the foster care system. And it was shocking to me, shocking. That's still the word I use today. I would walk in. I remember my first day on the job because I I got attacked, which was my fault. I had no idea what I was walking into, none. I had grown up in a large family. I'm one of five, big Italian family, big extent. So I, and I grew up babysitting, thought, hey, I love kids. I'll be good with kids. Um, these were unlike any children I had ever met, ever. And everything I had read in a book, Robin, again, you have to think 30 years ago, we didn't have the brain science. Um, we didn't even, we weren't using the word attachment. We didn't know a lot of what we know now. But I walked in and went like, holy crap, what what happened? These looked like and were very distressed beings. Mm-hmm. They There wasn't laughter. There wasn't play. Um, my first day as I went in to kind of hug a kid, I'm a pretty touchy, friendly person. I went in, they were introducing me and I went, hey, and he turned, he was 11 years old. He turned and chased me with a pool stick, trying to hurt me, mm. like really like get away from me. What I, what I didn't know in that moment is he had scars all down his back from being beaten um, with mm. his dad's steel toed boots. Mm. So I had triggered a trauma response with him, but I had no idea, n- none. And as I basically was chewed up and spit out by all these children, I learned more from those children than I ever learned from any book as I opened myself up to have them teach me about the effects of of trauma and neglect and the deep wounds they carried as small beings on this planet. And I I made a commitment to myself that um, as long as there's children like these stuck in a a very large system, Mm -hmm. and right now we have about one in six children that go into the system are there more than five years. They Mm -hmm. they don't get out. So I'm really passionate. Um, It's why the movie Instant Family became so important. So those of you that watched it, it's, Mm -hmm. if you want to see my life in a snapshot, (laughs) it was in that movie. Um, And So much of of what I think is misunderstood because we focus a lot on behaviors when it comes to children's trauma, as opposed to the deeper wounds that become embedded within their emotional interior. So I'm really passionate about child welfare in particular and helping kids heal. So hence kind of my book and everything I do is really kind of stemming from that. In fact, I always put everything I do in front of Constellation members adoptive parents or adoptees or children in foster care, the teens I work with in foster care, they preview everything. So it, my hope is, feels authentic and true um, to their experience. But I always credit everything to who taught me the most, which are all the the kids from foster care and that have what we call developmental trauma. Mm. So in your book, you talk about seven core issues in adoption and permanency so that our listeners can pretty much get a baseline of what that's all about. Can you tell us what those seven core issues are and and maybe just a couple of lines about how they relate to adoption? Sure. So to to begin, Robin, I, I'd say the the core issues really important because the history in adoption in this country um, really revolves around what we call the two S's, secrecy and shame, Mm. that we grew up even initially telling parents to never tell children that they were adopted. Mm -hmm. There's so much uh, deceitfulness or withholding or um, out and out lies around children's histories that the profound losses, and I don't use that word lightly, these are profound losses for a child. To lose the parents and the family trees that they were they were born onto, that carry their lineage, their history, their ethnicity, their race, their culture, like th- these are profound life-altering losses. 
So the, the first issue, which you can see, is, is what we call the core losses. And, and we often think, and this is where folks, and I loved your intro, Robin, because you said, if you don't have the lived experience, you, you tend to go, oh, well, how big can these losses be? Mm-hmm. And once you have lived experience, whether you're a parent or a child or a birth first parent, you go, oh, these are profound, lifelong, intergenerational losses. So when I say a, the core loss, um, especially for the child or the adoptee, I want us to be thinking about not just the birth first parent, the birth first mother, the birth first father they're losing, but they're losing that whole familial tree from that, from their per- parentage. Those core losses create often intense feelings of rejection, which is the second loss, stemming from that core loss. Rejection, often deep feelings of abandonment, like, why me? Why didn't you want me? Um, Was I bad? Kids think very egocentrically about these losses. They're not going, oh, the grownups couldn't take care of me. (laughs) Little ones are very narcissistic and very egocentric about this loss. It hurts. It feels like rejection and abandonment. And especially if they're adopted as a baby, sometimes we tend to not think they're going to experience these losses, but nothing could be further from the truth. Those core losses and those feelings of rejection or abandonment can lead to often intense feelings of shame or guilt, which is the next core loss. And shame and rejection are very different and hopefully we'll have some, I mean, shame and guilt Um, that hopefully we'll have some time to go into that because many of our adoptees end up with deep feelings of shame. Why wasn't I good enough? It feels very personal and intimate to them. And the next core issue is grief. And I always have folks kind of circle grief in the core issues because that's where the work is. But we're not a culture that grieves very well. Remember the history in adoption and permanency, we've been denying these losses. We don't talk about these losses. That's why I was so excited to come on your show. I'm like, we're going to talk about everything with kids. Yeah, we're going to talk about everything. And in adoption and permanency, we don't talk about these things. What The whole reason why I wrote the book and our second book, which is a workbook for parents, to really give parents the tools they need. Because what we find is parents often avoid these issues because the issues are triggering for kids. So we avoid the the grief and the loss because it stirs up so much pain. Mm -hmm. So we're working to try to minimize it, sometimes in the wrong ways. It's why grief is so important. So we really want to spend time unpacking the, the grief issues for kids. Now, the next issue is identity. And if you, if we haven't assisted kids in understanding and acknowledging these first core issues, how do they build an identity around all the missing pieces to themselves? So think about that. If, if you didn't know your, your maternal family history, your paternal family history, if you had no genetic mirroring, figuring out who you are would be really difficult. In fact, all of this does tend to hit the fan for the adoptee and adolescents which is really confusing for parents. They're going, well, we adopted him as a baby. Why is all this intensifying? And teen, the teen years, because identity formation is at the forefront, becomes very significant for the adoptee. So all the issues resurface then. We put, for the next core issue, we put identity and intimacy right next to each other. They're like two sides of the same coin. If I don't know who I am, if I don't know my needs, If I don't feel good about who I am, strong in my identity, how do I communicate my needs to you? How do I feel good about creating emotional intimacy in significant relationships? This is where often we hear the imposter syndrome. You know, our teens can create a social identity. Oh, I want people to perceive me this way, even though on the inside I'm confused and I might even have identity bewilderment. I don't know who I am. Right. So really helping because those two sides of the same coin can be very complex for a young person to try to sort through, especially if there hasn't been enough openness around relationships or communication connected to the birth first family and that lineage. It's really important. Mm -hmm. And then the last issue, um, control and mastery and control and mastery are on a continuum where there is lack of mastery and think developmental mastery, we have high needs for control. So many of our kids or constellation members can really fight for a lot of control 
because they lost so much control right from the get-go of their life experience that they're going to, you know, for many of our adoptees, their story begins with loss and trauma. So to try to avoid more loss and trauma, they can fight morning, noon, and night for control and more control. So we can see lots of power struggling within that parent-child attachment relationship. Mm -hmm. So you can see how complex these issues, now I just simplified them, but Mm -hmm. I can do eight days of training on on all of them, especially for clinicians, because we certainly want clinicians to really understand the complexities of these for the whole family system. Mm -hmm. So adoption is often talked about as a gift and you talk about that in your book. And, and again, that simplifies so many things. You discuss that flip side of loss uh, and you talk about that as your first core issue. And you say that that grief is a gateway to healing, which is hard to get to, of course, uh, if you don't acknowledge that there's been a loss. And it was interesting that you were naming the loss involved for everybody involved, right? You, you're talking about the loss for the child, which we can be pretty knowledgeable about because we, we th- that's inherent in adoption, right? They're losing their connection to their birth parents. We don't often talk about the loss for the birth parents, uh, because they are often vilified or or made to sound simple minded um, or or crazy in some way, and the and then we don't often talk about the loss for the adoptive parents either because they're gaining so much. They're gaining this child that they have been wanting for so long, and you acknowledge in it that there is a loss there as well because perhaps they've been attempting to birth their own child, or there was a loss in their family, and now they're adopting. So can you tell us how we can move to grieving that loss? How do we talk to kids about the fact that there is this loss, that we need to grieve this loss, and in order to get to the other side? of, of that feel, all those feelings, we, we have to kind of trudge through this unpleasant part of it. How do we do that? What's the, what are some of the strategies we might even use? What might we say? Oh, that's a kind of the million dollar question, Robin, right? (laughs) And I love how you framed it. I want to go back to first, how you framed it. The intersectionality of all the constellation members, which you named the birth first parents, by the way, they're not the only ones with losses. You have grandparents that lost a grandchild. You have aunts and uncles that lost a niece or nephew. The ripple effect on the birth first familial tree of that loss and the reason for that loss, our history in this country um, that came from the original, it was originally, it was domestic adoptions. Now the majority of adoptions are from foster care. It's why you hear my shift in language, birth first family, birth first parents, because many of the children that are adopted today from foster care were parented by their first parents, sometimes Mm. for years. Mm. So they're not, quote, kind of just birth parents. That's a term that comes from the history of private domestic adoptions. So when we're thinking about the losses on those familial trees, we really do want to understand the depth of those losses. For adoptive parents and foster parents and our kinship parents, their losses, especially for our kinship parents, are connected to the birth parent losses who they're often in relationship with. For adoptive parents, traditional adoptive parents come with infertility. Um, So the losses, which, by the way, are really significant lifelong losses, just because, quote, we become a parent, we don't ever cure infertility. You're not ever genetically connected to that child. And those losses linger over the lifespan and can create some emotional landmines between parent and child as attachment is always kind of in play, if you will. I'm going to switch to the child for a moment to to get to your question. But I wanted to to frame it around the intersectionality of all the losses, 
because really it's why we, we wrote the book, because it's often what folks don't really get when I say emotional landmines. So the child who's in the, the center, I want you to see the birth first family here and the adoptive family here, their story is connected to this story over here and the parent's story over here and all the core issues intersect. Our adoptive parents really, I always say, have twice the work because they have to do double time. They have to acknowledge their own core issues while they're acknowledging and assisting their child through their core issues. There are additional parenting tasks for our adoptive parents, lots of additional tasks. So it's why I say for our parents, please get the support you need. Find a professional that one knows what the hell they're doing <laughs> or find a parent support group that is unique to your familial system that will help you address your own core issues. When we don't address ours as parents, we don't address our kids very well. Any blockages I have in my own grief or stuckness or triggers that I have um, will come and be played out through my parent-child attachment relationship. So addressing these core issues, one, I always say, start with one simple rule for all of our parents and professionals, become a truth teller. Become a truth teller in every way that we have to be able to speak about really difficult things. And I'll give you an example. So if if I adopted my child at birth and now they're five years old and we're, they're really starting to understand, wait, I didn't grow inside of you. No, you grew inside your birth first mommy and she gave birth to you. And, and by the way, we don't really understand that developmentally until we're five, six or seven mm -hmm. because we're trapped inside of a brain that can only understand what it can understand. So when my child might say for the first time, so you're not my real mommy or I need to be able to go, oh, we need to talk about adoption right now. Sometimes being adopted is really hard. Let's talk about being adopted right now because I can tell that's hard for you in this moment. So instead of us act or reacting as a parent might like defending themselves, like, how dare you? I am your real mom. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> we can we can go into a defensive posture when when my child is bringing that up, they're in the middle saying it's hard to think about somebody else in this role that I don't maybe even know that person. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lots of times there isn't openness in adoption. Imagine feeling like you're a child trying to understand, wait, I, I grew inside someone else. I, and I want to tell you a story connected to this because this will really help hit this home. A few years ago, I was working with uh, a family. They had a young man that was adopted from foster care. They were he was placed on a hospital hold. So they literally went to the hospital when he was a baby, picked him up, took him home and adopted him from foster care. The story they told the child as he grew up was we went to the hospital. We picked you up. We wanted to make a family. We couldn't make a baby. So we adopted you. That was the story that he was told. He suffered with ADHD, um, lots of learning challenges. Um, when I met him, he was eight, almost nine years old. He, my first session with him, um, and I had met with a parent. So I told them, I'm always going to start with truth telling about helping kids understand what I call the global adoption story. What's the global adoption story? It's not their story, but it's, it's the adoption story. Like why, why do some kids get adopted? And this is the basic way to tell that story. Cause this is really important. It takes a man and a woman to make a baby, always. That baby grows inside the woman's body, inside a place called her womb. She gives birth to that baby. If that baby isn't raised by those two parents and is raised over here in this forever family, that's called adoption. And I usually show this in a visual way, because as you know, Robin, kids are very visual. Auditory processing isn't their strength. So I'm mm -hmm. using right? Stuffed animals, or I'm using a visual picture mm -hmm. showing the story. So I tell this global story to this young man. He's almost nine years old. He starts, he, he starts sobbing and shaking on my floor, oh. sobbing and shaking on my floor. And I, and in the moment I just was rubbing his back. I didn't quite know what had happened. So I just was comforting him. He was sobbing uncontrollably. You know, when the body goes into this uncontrollable a uh, full body saw. When he finally calmed down, it took a few minutes and I just said, you know, what happened? Tell me what happened. 
And he said, I thought I grew in a tube. Whoa. That's what came out of his mouth. And, and it confused me at first because I, I said, can you say that again? He said, I thought I grew in a tube. And then I, then it, then I understood because the story his parents had told him Mm -hmm. was we went to the hospital, we picked you up, we brought you home, we adopted you. What they were missing was the whole beginning Mm. of his story Mm. that every human, every human is made by a man and a, and a woman. Those were your birth parents. Oh, by the way, your birth mother has a name. It's Jenny. Your birth father has a name. It's John. They're Mm -hmm. real people. Imagine a child with magical thinking, not understanding any of this. We have to concretize it, make it really, really concrete and be truth tellers. One, because we need kids to feel normal. Like Mm -hmm. I wasn't born from a tube Mm -hmm. or I wasn't born on Mars Mm -hmm. or I didn't fall from the sky. Mm -hmm. What makes this so hard for parents, Robin, is the child's story begins with loss and trauma. So often adoptive parents trying to protect children from the loss and the trauma they make up a nice story Mm -hmm. that often begins with their story. Like my story is I had infertility and we wanted to make a family. So we got you. Mm -hmm. That's the parent's story. We need to begin the child's story with the beginning of the child's story, which is on with two different parents, right? Mm -hmm. A birth first mother and a birth first father on those familial trees. Hence it's why the it's why we wrote the book because what we often see, and I work with, by the way, adult adoptees, I do an adult adoptee support group. So helping minimize the losses over the lifespan by starting earlier with truth telling, because we can't grieve what we never acknowledge. Mm -hmm. So if we're never telling the truth, we go, we're just going to save all the grief till you're an adult. No, because identity is building from the moment we're born. Identity is not just forming in adolescence. So we have to be truth tellers right from the very, very beginning. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's really important information and uh, will help those who are listening right now to realize that the work is is now. The work is really important right now. Now, I had spoken to my children's birth mom. My my children, we, we adopted them from birth uh, and they are full blood siblings. So I, I adopted one and then got a text message from our birth mom and wound up adopting another uh, 16 months later. So I spoke with our children's birth mom not too long ago uh, over we were Facebook messaging each other. And, and she admitted to me that sometimes she worried that our kids would feel that she rejected them because years later she started her own family and had a son. She's married, she has a son. She's completely infatuated with him. Um, and I spoke to my my daughter about it. She's 13 and and told her what her birth mother had had said and her concern. And my daughter was actually surprised about it that, you know, this other person is feeling feelings and, and my birth and my, my, my uh, daughter had said to me that she knew that she, that, that her birth mom was doing the right thing, that she believed she was doing the right thing um, and from the beginning and was doing what she believed was best for them. Both birth parents were doing that given their age and their financial situation and their readiness to have, a family at the time. And I wound up after she, my daughter told me this, I relayed that message back to the birth mom, because I really think it's important for her not to be carrying this burden that she's thinking that this is very serious for her, that her, that her children, her birth children are going to feel negatively about her because, and, and about themselves. That was a big thing. I don't want them to feel that they are not good enough, that they were rejected because of that. Um, So I, and she's, she said that was really good news for her and hopefully she takes that into her heart. Um, But I, I also have friends who, you know, have children who, who are really, struggling with that rejection piece and are feeling like they don't understand why, why were they rejected in that way? 
So when you have a child who says to you, my, I, I was adopted because my parents didn't want me. How do we, how do we talk to them about that piece? Because in, if you're looking at adoption, that can be an explanation that kids feel a lot that there is that they were not wanted, and so they were adopted. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give kind of two responses, Robin, and it's just, I'm so glad you bring out you know just the the diversity of the adoption experience because there's no two adoptions ever that are the same mm-hmm. ever. Every child experiences their own adoption in a very intimate, often confusing mm. way. It's very personal to them. So these feelings, which is what I recommend every adult, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a therapist, the very first thing to do when the child's sharing this is to one, validate their feeling. Don't try to talk them out of the feeling like, oh, don't feel that way. And they didn't really mean to. Mm. Or we, we don't often, this is again, where I say the grief is so important. Because so many of us were uncomfortable with the core issues. So we work to talk them out of it. Oh, let me explain why this. And we we go into this explanation Mm -hmm. and the kids left with, so I shouldn't feel how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. No, feel how you're feeling. It's our job to validate your feelings. If you're feeling hurt in this moment, because it does feel like, well, she's parenting other her other kids and she's Mm -hmm. not parenting me. That does hurt. And by the way, if you've raised really loving, caring kids, they're going to be like, oh, well, I don't want her to feel bad. So I'll make sure she doesn't feel bad. But yeah, it freaking hurts. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the hard parts of it and not always try to kind of put a nice bow on it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. what we in the, in, in the field of, of adoption often have done, including parents, a lot of the books out there for kids. I'm like, "Mm, that book's more for parents (laughs) Mm. than it is for kids because they try to make us feel good. Yeah. And they can serve to minimize the losses. So the first part is just making sure you go, tell me more about that. Because what I'm hearing underneath that is how much it hurts. And by the way, most parents that adopt, they are not adopted. So they don't know how that part of it feels. Mm -hmm. So to really say, and by the way, I have parents and and the grownups be curious. Tell me more about that. I want you to view the core issues like Mm -hmm. Your kid has a suitcase packed with all the core issues and you want them to unpack it, not try to fix it for all the grownups. Remember, they're between Mm -hmm. their birth parents and their adoptive parents. Mm -hmm. And kids are often like, oh, we have a loyalty conflict. Oh, I don't want them to be upset with me or I don't want Mm -hmm. them to reject me. I don't want my parents to be upset with me. Mm -hmm. We have to make all of this much more okay. meaning let your kid unpack all their hurt. Um, feelings of abandonment, like, wow, I can see how it, it would feel like that. Sit with the feeling for before you go into explaining, because that's part two. Yes, go into, well, let's talk about the facts of your adoption. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about what was going on with your birth mother the day you were born or the circumstances around her pregnancy, because mm-hmm. that's going to help you really understand that crisis. Because by the way, for most of our birth first parents, it's a moment of crisis. It's either an unplanned pregnancy, mental illness, addiction, domestic violence. There's all kinds of complexities Mm -hmm. that we do need the child to understand or else they blame themselves for Mm -hmm. the adoption. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they didn't want me, Mm -hmm. but I say that's the second step after we make sure that we're really allowing this child to feel all their feelings, including the hurt and the pain and the suffering, because we don't know how that feels if we're not an adoptee. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that's really important. And I think as we know that this is never one conversation, this is many along the way and answering a lot of tough questions um, and, and sitting with pain that is undulating that you know, may feel fine at one point and not fine at other points. What about the opportunity for, for children to, let's say, quote unquote, meet their birth parents, because of course they've met them, but if they don't live near their, their birth family, 
and they have an opportunity to get to know their birth family. But there's a lot there, right? There's a lot there. So for the adoptive parents, there's that feeling of maybe they will reject me now because they will want to be with their birth family or they're going to see that it's better, you know, with them or they're going to feel more connected. All the pieces will fit for the birth for the child. Uh, they they can have fear. They they might say something like, I don't know them. Uh, I don't know them and you're my parents and the feeling that they don't want to upset you as the adoptive parents. There's the birth family who has moved forward with their life. I'm not going to say moved on. They've moved forward with their lives in that they've, they've maybe gotten married or they've had children that may have now have their nuclear family. So how do we how do we view the, this this getting to know each other as the children are now getting a little older understand more maybe they're going into their preadolescence or adolescence and they've been asking questions and the adoptive parents go maybe is this the time shall we should we have them meet what what would you say about that so i'm and I, I want to respond first to you, Robin, because it's really clear you have lived experience. Because <laughs> I don't know that I've done an interview where someone was as adept at going into the depth and complexities of these issues. So it's really, really clear. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm a massive proponent of of openness. Mm-hmm. Um because it it avoids the search and reunion when an adoptee is 50 years old and now has accumulated 50 years of core issues, grief, loss, assumptions that are made in our mind about who the birth parent is and why they didn't want me or what the story really is because the, the birth parent story is often told through the adoptive parent lens, mm. not the person that the story begins with. It's so helpful to a child and the adoptive parents to to be relationship builders. Um, The challenge, and I want to preface this before I give a a way to kind of uh, a a tool to assist with this, because of how many blended families we have out in the world, right? We have um, step parents, we have um, foster parents, kinship parents, a lot of grand families right now. Like we're very, we're, we're used to a lot of diversity inside fam- family systems. Mm-hmm. So we we want to create much more kind of okayness around openness and being a part of a large extended family, which we hope the birth first family system, not just the parents, but maybe there's grandparents on that Mm -hmm. side that want to have that connection, right? So Mm -hmm. lots of of openness. Not that this isn't tricky because the core issues create these challenges, but I do want to kind of help us think about, I always say, there's three kinds of parents that, and think about it like lanes in a freeway. So there are legal parents who has the legal rights to a child right? There are the genetic parents, the genetic parents, who's connect, who made the child, the DNA, half their DNA is from a woman, half their DNA is from a man, the genetic, and like the attachment parents, the parents in the trenches doing the work of attachment. Most of us grew up in families where all three of those were the parents that made us, they were our legal parents and our attachment parents. So all those lanes on the freeway are one set of parents. For adoptive parents, they are not the genetic parents and will never be the genetic parents. And we really do want adoptive parents to acknowledge that their own core issues are connected to that. Like I'll never be the genetic parent of my child. So there are things I can't give to my child because I'm not in that lane on the freeway. Now, we don't have to fear that lane. We can actually be really open to like, oh, I'm in these two lanes. I'm the legal parent and I'm the attachment parent. Really important lanes, by the way, especially that attachment mm-hmm. parent lane, right? So we we want, first of all, the child to be able to go, oh, like I can love my birth first parents. Yeah, you mm-hmm. can love them. It's really important to know where some of their personality traits come from, where their looks or their size or their 
uh, mannerisms come from. So all that genetic mirroring is really validating for the child. Mm-hmm. That when I can get, and I work, I do a lot of openness and search and reunion. When I can get all the grownups really working well together, that's best for the child because the child can go, oh, my parents aren't in conflict with one another, mm-hmm. right? They're, and it doesn't make me feel like, oh, I have to please everyone so nobody rejects me. And I don't get abandoned again, which is often a very big fear for mm-hmm. adoptees. It's often why we get a little bit of that people-pleasing behavior, what, what can later turn into an imposter syndrome, like that social identity, like, oh, I'm just here to make sure everybody's okay with me. So mm-hmm. I struggle sharing some of these deeper, harder feelings. So it's so important for, and oftentimes I have, I make sure the grownups, if there's openness or we're opening a closed adoption to make sure we're meeting for coffee or you have an adoption professional that can help you all get on the same page around what the child's core issues and needs are. What's the narrative and the story that we're telling the child so it can be reinforced in really honest, open ways. And then, and now I'm going to give you a tool for the child because it's really helpful. Um, By the way, I'm working on my last book, which is helpful to say here because my, my workbook that I'm working on now, Robin is for children and teens. Mm. The first half is for children and their core issues. The second half is really, and that's a pretty meaty half for teens that are adopted or in foster care around all their core issues. Mm. Mm. One of the activities in this workbook, and it's a workbook, so it's built in a very practical, digestible way with lots of tools And these are strengths-based tools. So we can do a deep dive into everything while we're skill building. I have kids create two jars and get a mason jar, right? So you get two mason jars. And with your kid, you're going to cut out all these slips of paper. And one of the jars is going to be their loss jar. So you label on the jar loss. And we want kids to be able to, over time, and sometimes with a grown-up's help, whenever you're feeling some of that some of the pain from the core issues. What are those losses that you do have? Because adoption, by the way, creates losses. But those losses are recognized developmentally as the young person unfolds. So my losses at five look different than when they're eight, look different than when they're at 10. Now I'm 15. I may have a whole jar filled with my losses because at 15, I have a lot of losses. And by the way, in adoption and permanency, Robin, a lot of the losses are what we call ambiguous losses. So a, an ambiguous loss is a, a profound loss without any closure. Mm-hmm. So for kids, especially in a closed adoption, it can feel like my birth parents died. It mm-hmm. feels to me like a death. I don't see them. They're not even real to me. Like mm-hmm. I don't know them. Where do I mourn that loss? Where's the gravestone? Where's where where the body's buried, so Mm -hmm. to speak? So it's Mm -hmm. what makes grief so difficult because the losses in adoption and permanency are often really ambiguous. They get triggered around birthdays. Birthdays are very important. This is the day I was birthed. And once I really understand what I lost, birthdays become trickier for me. Mother's Day. Father's Day. Where's my other mother or my birth mother? Is she thinking of me? Did she hold me? Did she name me? Did she want me? These are very real losses that oftentimes adoptees aren't sharing. Why aren't they sharing them? Because they're often stuck inside. Oh, I don't want to make my parents upset, either parents. So I'll just tuck all these losses deep inside. This is why I want parents and grownups to create the jar. Let's put all those losses in the jar. Because by the way, all these losses are very real. And I'm not adopted if I'm a parent. So I go, I don't know what your losses are, how you experience those losses. One time, and I'll give you an example. I was working with um, a group of young girls. They were all nine and 10 years old. And I was doing this loss jar exercise. I was talking about all the losses connected to adoption. (laughs) One of my girls, and I counted them, as she's putting in losses, put in 52 losses in her jar. Do you know what I lost? I lost my dog. I lost my grandma. I lost my sister to adoption. I lost, I lost, I lost, I lost all these things. When you look at that loss jar, then you go, oh, how do we grieve? How do we 
by the way, grief is often displaced or minimized or projected onto somebody safe like their parent. Mm -hmm. So it can come out as anger at the parent, right? The next jar, and I'm just going to finish my tools. The next jar, I'd have you get another big mason jar, all you parents out there, and label it adoption questions. And that's where at any time, this young person can put every single question that's coming up inside of their heart and their psyche. Well, I wonder about this and why she couldn't do this or where's my birth father and does he have a name and how tall is he? And all of the things, all of the questions that often never get shared, never get answered. Because if we're gonna open a closed adoption now when let's say that child's 18 or 20 or 25, I would pull out both of those jars to do some preparing and some, let's see how many questions we can answer. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that happens immediately in adoption is a thousand questions for the adoptee and lots of feelings connected to those questions. And often most of those questions can go unanswered, especially in a closed adoption. All of this can create a lot of internal distress and upheaval. So many of our kids get diagnoses like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder and a lot of issues that are more connected to the trauma and the losses they experienced right at the very beginning of their life. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That is a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. I feel like I could talk to you all day, but I, we, we've, we've already covered so many, so much time. <laughs> I feel like I need like a whole day with you. Um, but I want to make sure I get this one thing out there, which is it sounds like adoption has so many facets to it that aren't all that pleasant, according to your book. So are you saying that adoption is not a good idea? No, I'm not saying that um, at all. So I'm glad you asked the question because, by the way, there's a lot of anti-adoption sentiment. There is. Out, That's why I wanted to get it out there. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's one of the oldest stories in, in the book. You know, the, the first adoption story, Moses. Adoption has been around since the beginning of time. Kinship specifically, informal kinship, has been around since the beginning of time. As long as there are things like rape and domestic violence and oppression and war and refugees and extreme poverty, we will always need this thing called permanency and adoption. So I am we have children right now that have no permanency that are being raised or warehoused in group homes and congregant care. And so what they need more than anything is relational permanency attachment, commitment. That's what I mean by permanency, relational permanency, someone that's going to be committed to me and love me over my lifespan. Adoption is just a piece of paper at the end of the day. Um, we have many kids that have failed adoptions or dissolved adoptions. Um, always unacceptable. It's actually why we wrote our, our second book to really help parents address some of these complexities because it is really tricky and complex and a lot of work for parents. Mm -hmm. So I'm very kind of pro making sure kids have what they need today that we can't. I'm also pro going upstream <laughs> and addressing some of the systemic issues that we have. Mm -hmm. um, poverty, oppression, right? All mm -hmm. the systemic challenges that create the need for adoption. The fact that children don't have what they most need. We have a tremendous epidemic of addiction right now in mm -hmm. our culture. And that creates high numbers of children coming into foster care and then children languishing in, in foster care with no relational permanency. And so they emancipate from our system and then they're homeless and on our streets and they may have children. So the cycle of systemic poverty and neglect and addiction recreates itself. So we'll always have the need for folks to, to lean in um, and take kids with high needs. I'm just really wanting families and parents to have what they need mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I feel like often even the professional community, Robin, can fail our families, can fail our parents. We don't have enough um, 
adoption competent professionals out there that are clinically competent in these mm -hmm. issues that understand the interplay of attachment and developmental trauma in the way that they need to. So when the parent is in the trauma trenches and they feel like I'm failing this child, I feel like I'm failing. How long can you hold on before we go? I feel like a failure. Parents have what we call a parental identity. How I feel about me as a mother, how I feel about me as a father. How long can I get up every day feeling like I'm not helping? I'm making mm -hmm. this worse and I might want to give up. So I understand the pain of that. So I want more parents to get the help and support that, that they need. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your amazing work. It's so important. And I'd love to have you back on so we can talk about things like international adoption and cross-racial adoption, because there's so many good, there's so much more to, to explore here that we, we didn't yet. And I, I would love to do that. And I think that probably takes its own, its completely own podcast episode. So Give us your top tip if you could leave us with one takeaway about adoption, talking about adoption, the facets of adoption while parenting, what would it be? Um, I think it would be for, for parents, any parent that's an adoptive foster kinship parent, to make sure you're in a a parenting group with your peers. And I mean the peers that are parenting in a similar way as you. So if you're an adoptive parent, get into an adoptive parent support group. Um, those of you, by the way, that saw the movie Instant Family, what you saw was we put the support group, that was Allison's support group, by the way, I do a support <laughs> group for parents. Um, three different scenes in that movie were the support group. And that was very intentional. Because I want parents to make sure that they get the support they need. Kids do well when parents are doing well. And we don't do well if we don't get the support we need. Mm -hmm. And if you're a parent in the trauma trenches, you can talk to your family and your friends and other people. But if they're not in the trauma trenches, mm -hmm. they're going to be giving you all the wrong stuff to do. And you're going right. to go like, you don't even get what I'm doing. And I'm going to be like, yeah, they don't get no, they don't. what you're doing because <laughs> they're not navigating the landmines, all the emotional landmines connected right. to the core issue. So I want parents to get what they need. And if you don't have that group, find that group because sometimes we just need to vent. Sometimes we just need to blow off steam. Mm -hmm. I want parents to blow off steam. So again, what you saw in, in Instant Family where the parents are like, wow, they said that? Yeah, I'll give you a quick story, Robin, because it was super cute. When we were screening the movie and we screened it all across this country before it ever came out to adoptive parents, to foster parents, our very first screening was at the NACAC, which is the National Association on uh, Adoptable Children. And it was a room, like hundreds of adoptive parents and professionals. At the end of the movie, they got up and yelled and screamed like who did it? Like they were laughing at all the hysterical parts. And then we screened it and here in Long Beach, just people off the street, like just your average person, not connected to adoption. Very interesting. I sat um, with the with the screenwriter, Sean Anders, in the back of the movie theater. And it was very funny. Folks not connected with lived experience to the core issues. They were like, oh, can we laugh at that? Like mm. that's ha ha ha. Like a, we didn't get the standing ovation. Um, in the same way, I mean, they were laughing, but it did not resonate in the same way for parents that have the lived experience that finally saw their core issues up on the screen. Mm -hmm. By the way, all the core issues were embedded in that movie, mm -hmm. including the honeymooning and then like, oh, how do mm -hmm. we get rid of these kids? Because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> right. All done in a very intentional way mm -hmm. um, because the hard parts are there, but there's also healing. There's mm -hmm. also levity. So making sure, again, parents have what they need. And if you don't have it, find it. Our parents are resilient. Find what you need, right? Mm -hmm. That group that's going to be there to support you through all the ups and downs of the core issues and parenting a kid uh, with crisis and, and the trauma issues connected mm -hmm. to adoption. Okay. And give us the resource of the week. Where can we go to get more information about you, your book, your workbook, and the work you're doing? So I'll give you two. Um, one, my website, allisondavismaxson.com. 
I always post articles. There's actually videos on me doing some trainings on the core issues. And also my organization, the National Center um, on Adoption and Permanency, which is ncap-us.org. You can go on there. Um, we have a wonderful podcast series. Um, actually, it's a webinar series, I got, um, I should say. Next month in January, we have an amazing um, colleague and friend of mine who's an adoptee. And she's doing, she's a trauma therapist and specialist, but she's doing um, intergenerational trauma in the adoption um, permanency community. And that's going to be a really good webinar. And we always do um, new webinar series specific to these issues that touch members of the constellation. Awesome. I'll, I'll be putting all the links on our show notes today. For So for those of you who are running around, don't worry, I got you. And I want to thank you so much, Allison, for all of your insight, your strategies, your gentle way. I, I really appreciate the, the very many different sides of adoption that you brought to light and that we were able to lay on the table today. And even though we didn't get into everything. I feel like it was a very good start. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Robin. And thank you for the good work that you do. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours. So let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. You can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com. Twitter, I'm under Dr. Robin. I'm also on Instagram under Dr. Robin Silverman. I'll be going back and forth with Allison uh, all week about this podcast episode so that we can talk about what was said. I know that you may have some questions, you may have some statements, you may want to uh, bring something to light, you might want to tell your story. We want to hear all about that. And I'll be creating some memes based on what Allison said, because I know she said some things that were really poignant and that we may want to share with our friends and our family and our community. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it. I can't tell you how much much that means to me and how much of an impact it makes. When you give those five-star reviews, it goes out to who knows where with all their algorithms and it makes a huge difference. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. My fellow parents, leaders, and educators, thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. So many great podcasts up there and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you've got this. I am sure that if you are involved with adoption in some way, this episode hit you and that's okay. There's a lot to process here. You're getting this information. It may be sending you backwards and going, oh, I did this wrong. I said this wrong. I forgot to do this. Don't do that to yourself because you are getting the information you need right now. And we are in this together. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. I see you and I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next time. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.